Shalom, Ruchim Abayim, and welcome to Sheva Pani La Torah to the 70 Faces of the Torah and also Sula Yaakov. I wanted to share a special study with you guys, and I've subtitled this teaching, The Apostle Paul, Head Coverings in Jewish Law. Now you might actually ask, what's up with this topic and where is this coming from? Well, in light of a recent topic that was on Rabbi Asher Mays's podcast, normally he has a podcast on Monday nights and also Motzi Shabbat, it was an interesting discussion regarding the topic of head coverings, such as shtetls and techols and things of that nature. And while the group was discussing this topic and the halachic requirements about a woman having a head covering, a question was brought up about head coverings in the New Testament, specifically in the epistle of Corinthians, where Rashul or the Apostle Paul, he had advised the women in Corinth that they needed to wear a head covering. And so what I want to show is I want to play a clip from Rabbi Mesa's podcast uh, just to give you guys a gist of what it's talking about uh, because as the topic came up, the question was never really answered. In other words, one of the, um, one of the individuals on the podcast, they wanted to know uh, what was the actual background, why Paul mentioned it. Now, from what I understand, Rabbi Mesa used to be a uh, Christian believer. I'm not sure if he was a clergyman of any sorts of that nature. Um, so nonetheless, you know, he talked about it in nature, but they never really got into depth. And uh, I wanted to address the topic by itself. I was going to try to actually chime in, uh, log on to their podcast. However, I was in the middle of driving and I was on my way home. So I figured I would address the topic by itself, that way without taking up everyone's time. Um, and therefore, for those of you guys who follow me, uh, if you find this topic insightful, and you can actually ask me questions and send me emails, things of that nature. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and roll the clip here so you guys can see what they're talking about, and then we'll come back and we'll address it. Uh, having been uh -huh. a, a uh, Christian pastor before, and the Apostle Paul now being Jewish, for those that don't know, uh, the uh, Paul, the teacher in the supposed New Testament, he said that women should have a covering on their head too. And I was wondering, what is it in Christianity at that time was all Jewish? Where did they get that concept from other than uh, Judaism? And it wasn't for wigs. It was some kind of covering in order to maintain that God was above them and their husbands, they were under the authority of a husband. Or something like that. So I think when he said that, he was speaking to the Ephesians. Now, I'm not a Christian. You know, Asher Mates is quoting the Bible, but I happen to like know the New Testament. But I believe it's the Ephes this appears in Ephesians. You know, so like, he wasn't talking to Jews when he said it. Regardless, like whatever book it was, he wasn't talking. Like, it wasn't in Acts, uh, and it wasn't in Luke or whatever. I suppose, um, but he says that a man should not cover his head because, because uh, the Messiah is the head of man. And a woman should cover her head because the man is the head of of, of the woman, um, right? Something like that. I thought it was from Timothy, but no, 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 no. It, it doesn't even, matter. It gets even better. I don't remember exactly how it was, but I remember reading a while back. And at the end of it, he pretty much so he's he's going through this whole thing about you know what men should do. They shouldn't cover while praying, and women should cover while praying. But then it says, but that's not our tradition, so it doesn't matter. No, he doesn't say anything. And, and he doesn't no. mention prayer. I mean, I don't no, 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 no. It's specifically about prayer. No, it was all about prayer. It was all about the level. I'll find it. I'll find it. It's all about find it. It was all about authority. Right, that makes sense. So we saw that they were discussing there the passage that appears in First Corinthians in chapter eleven, specifically verses three to six. So what I want to do at this time is that I want us to take a look at these passages. And for a lot of you who grew up Christian, who were taught the New Testament, a lot of you have been taught a different narrative. Now, for a lot of you who were raised Jewish and were taught that Jesus is the Jewish boogeyman and that the New Testament paints another narrative, well, you're also going to be in for a surprise here tonight. Now, I also recommend for those from Jewish backgrounds, please consult with your local rabbi uh, before you actually learn about anything from the New Testament. I don't want to give the impression that anyone's being misguided. I am not of the belief system that Jewish people need to adhere to the New Testament while I myself teach it. Okay, my purpose of teaching it is to deal with a rectification of Jewish neshamot that are involved in Christianity and Messianic Judaism, and also for those from a non-Jewish background who desire to join the Jewish people. 
And so I believe there is a great need of doing a tikkun and rectifying a lot of damages of Christianity that have weaponized the New Testament over the past thousand years or so. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and get right into things here. And we're going to pull up on our screen the passage from 1 Corinthians. Now I rendered this in the transliteration of what is called in Hebrew, what it would be called in Hebrew, Corinthine, which is the plural of Corinthians, was said in Hebrew. And this is Aleph or 1, which is in the Garrett, it's an epistle. And what I've decided to do was I included the Greek and with some Hebrew and obviously English, and it's very relevant, which I'll explain why here in a minute. And just for a little background, the Hebrew that I include here is based on a translation from the Greek. So in other words, the Hebrew is not original. There's no knowledge of a Hebrew original of anything in the New Testament for that we know of. Those who claim there is or was, uh, there's no proof of that. I believe that if there was any uh, Semitic origin of the New Testament, it would have been in Aramaic. And I'll explain why as we go along here. Um, the Greek is also important because that is what we do have in transmission. Mind you, uh, the Greek itself is split into two different categories of how the manuscripts are discovered. There's either what's called a Western family or there's the Alexandrian family. And the Western family of the manuscripts of the New Testament have what's called Semitisms in them. And the Semitism means that the, the root of many of the, the Greek that's used there comes from a Semitic origin. Now, once again, a lot of people will be uh, you know, uh, they would be of the opinion that it comes from Hebrew, but not necessarily, considering that Yeshua and his disciples were from the Galil or the Galilee, they spoke Aramaic. Um, it's not, we don't know if Yeshua spoke uh, Mishnaic Hebrew, which is the Hebrew back then. Paul possibly is he identified as a Pohush, as a Pharisee who studied under Gamaliel, um, Gamaliel, excuse me. He would have been possibly been learned in this language, also learned in, in uh, Yavnit Greek as well. And so it's important to include the Greek as you take a look at some of the uh, Semitic origins of certain things. And I'm going to point that out here with Hashem as we take a look at that. So we're going to take a look at this passage here. So this is um, uh, 1 Corinthians. And once again, the Hebrew uh, that comes from a gentleman named Dalich. If I didn't explain that just now, I apologize. Dalich was someone who was fluent in Greek and also he was fluent in Mishnaic Hebrew. Now there are modern Hebrew translations in the New Testament on the market today, but uh, to me, they're not that great. Uh, they are no more different than the various Christian publications of the New Testament you could find in English, uh, depending upon the various publications, uh, KGV, New KGV, ESV, NASB, NIV, and all the other ones out there. And so the Dalich, to me, has proven the test of time. However, I do not rely upon it completely, because once again, depending on the manuscripts, whether it's from the Western Alexandrian family, one needs to be able to look at the actual uh, origins of the text in Greek to be able to make a proper understanding of what the text is saying. So without further ado, we're going to read here regarding the concept of women in head coverings in 1 Corinthians. Uh, this is chapter 11, verse 3 to 6. And so Paul writes there, he says, and I want you to know that the head of every man is the Messiah, and the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of the Messiah is God. And then he goes on to say, that every man who prays, so who's davening, praying, or prophesies, having his head covered, it says, dishonors his head. Now, this is important because it was seen like Paul is taking the issue with the concept of a head covering in Hebrew, what we call a kibah or Yiddish, a yarmulke, and we'll get to that in a minute. Then he goes on to say afterwards, uh, then he dishonors, mina, excuse me, mina, uh, mavil, hu et rosho, vecho isha, and every woman asher yit palel o, uh, says over here, Titnabe, who prays or prophesies, Virosha, Parua et Rosha, with her head uncovered. Okay, he, Minavelet ki Shavahi, that she dishonors her head. Why is that? For she is equal to a woman that has a shaved head, someone that's Guluach. In other words, there's a shaved head here. And that's interesting. We'll talk about that later on as well. And then it goes on to say, for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also cut off her hair. So we see that Paul obviously has an issue here with a woman who prays with her hair naturally shown, her natural hair, and he finds it repulsive, he finds it repugnant, and therefore he believes that she needs to basically remove all her hair because she's equivalent to a woman who does not have any hair. And we'll learn about that as well. 
He says, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shown or shaven, to let her cover her hair. In other words, if that is something repulsive, obviously from a cultural standpoint of the people of Corneth, then let them cover their head. In other words, this is the order. Now, let me explain something here which is very important. Contrary to how Paul, or was he was known in Hebrew, Rav Shul, how he was and is perceived in both Judaism and Christianity. The truth is, Paul himself governed himself according to halakha, okay? Now that might seem like a, a joke from a Jewish background because Jews are taught that, you know, Jesus is a Jewish boogeyman. Paul is the poster child who created Christianity. And, you know, basically the testament of time is the proof of what Christians have done to Jews throughout time. Crusades, Palm Grons, Inquisitions, etc. Now, from the Christian perspective, they have been taught that Paul has taught about doing away with the law. Um, you know, um, basically Jesus supersedes the law. And many other things. Both systems have their perceptions. Usually one is based on the other. Normally Jews look at how the Christians relate to the New Testament and that's how... Uh, they arrive at their consensus of understanding the writings of Paul or even the Gospels for that matter. I'm here to actually challenge that. Both systems are absolutely wrong when it comes to Paul. Now, one of the things you need to know is that chapters 11 through 14 of 1 Corinthians contextually relate to the subject matter of worship and liturgy. Okay? Liturgy in the context of a Jewish synagogue. This is important. And therefore, it is a weighty subject which deals mostly with reshut or with authority. When chapter 11 begins, it speaks about traditions that were taught by Paul or that which he has received. For example, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, when he begins the topic of the head covering, he first preambles or prefaces his teaching by saying over here, the zot ani Mishabeach etechem. He says, now I praise you. And so he's giving a form of shevak, acknowledging Echai, my brothers, okay, that you remember me in uh, all things. Regarding what? Lishmor et hakabalot kasher masarti lachem. To keep the ordinances that I have delivered to you. Now this is uh, very interesting here. When Paul mentions here, Lishmor et hakabalot kasher masarti lachem to keep this mitzorah, is the word in Hebrew, okay, or in the Greek, you'll see I have highlighted over here, paradosis katechite, to keep the traditions that I've delivered to you. He's referring to the transmission of Jewish law that he received. The Greek word that's highlighted here, the first one, and Greek is read left to right, like English, unlike Hebrew, which is right to left, the word here, paradosis, refers to the transmission of Jewish law. And what you need to know about that is that the Greek of the New Testament is a very poor Greek. It's something they call Kanoi Greek. And what's important about that is that the Yerushalayim Talmud tells us that there was an Aramaic Greek language. Not a Hebrew Greek language, but an Aramaic Greek language. And many of the Jews in the Galil or the Galilee region, they also borrow many times from Greek. In fact, we see this in the Jerusalem Talmud. Masechah Pesachim, for, ex for example, tells us about the significance of the etrog. In other words, the Torah doesn't tell us what an etrog is. It just calls it a beautiful fruit, right? There in Parsha Emor, Leviticus uh, 23. And so the Torah doesn't tell us. The Mishnah tells us what it is. And so Masechah Pesachim Yerushalayim, he tells us that it's, it grows near a water source. And there it talks about this concept of hydro, which in, obviously um, in the Greek it refers to a living water source uh, there, which is hidor, okay, because it's a play in the Hebrew word, which is hidar. But in Greek, hidor, which is where we get the word hydro from. It's a water source. It's a beautiful fruit like a hidor. And therefore, this is where you find this borrowed terminology in Greek and Aramaic. So why I point it out is because Galilean Jews, they were not very proficient in Aramaic. I mean, we find many times in the Talmud that the Galileans would criticize about how they would pronounce Aramaic, let, let alone Mishnaic Hebrew that was mostly spoken by the Jews of Judea. So what we learn from this is that many times in the Galilean dialect, they would borrow terms from Greek. This became known as Kanoi Greek, okay, a very poor Greek. And it just happens to be here that when Paul mentions in Greek, he says here that I have received uh, this, uh, 
this uh, mitzorah, this paradosis. This term here is referring specifically to Jewish law, okay? Not just any law, but Jewish law. Now, in Greek, paradosis could refer to either what we call deraita, which is biblical or Torah law, the rabbanan, that could be rabbinical, or it can actually be a minhag, a custom that's brought down by one's rebbe. For example, a few other passages in Paul's writing, when dealing with the topic of head coverings, Paul mentions in verse 16 that if somebody disagrees with him about his ruling regarding women wearing a head covering, they're entitled to disagree. Why are they entitled to disagree? Well, mostly because senithia ecclesia to theo, or velo derechihilota elokim, because we don't have a ruling on this specific subject in any of the kihilot or the congregations, the synagogues of God. Now, in Greek, I'll bring it up on the screen here, the, the word here, synethia, is a contraction of two other Greek words. Sin, as you see at the bottom right hand of the screen, sin and thos, thos is on the bottom left side. Sin means to form a union. Thos means habits. And so what Paul is saying here, when it comes to the topic of head coverings for non-Jewish women, there's actually no halakhic ruling for non-Jewish women on this subject. Why is that? Because non-Jews are not halakhically bound to the Torah as Jewish women are. And this also relates to the concept of what we call a ger toshav, or the rabbis are referred to as a ben noach or a noahide, which did not have a legal status at that time, specifically it did not have a legal status since the destruction of the Bayit Rishon, the first temple, Solomon's temple, in which the laws of Shemitah and Yovel had been suspended, not terminated, but had been suspended. And therefore, we know Rambam talks about this as well in the Mishnah Torah, that there is no legal status of a Noahide or Gertoshav at the current moment. One is either just a, a non-Jew or they become a Gersetic, they become a Jew. And so this was a very important subject matter at that time because there were certain subject matters that did not have halakhic rulings between leniencies and stringencies with Jews and non-Jews, which ultimately led to the rabbinic edict of the 18 measures that were passed in the house of Hananiah ben Cheschiah ben Gurion, that's talked about in the Mishnah, which ultimately created an upheaval in which some of the students of Halal were killed by the students of Shammai, maybe not Shammai directly, but the Sikorim, or the Sikarios, the Assassino Jews from the Zealot movement. So this is very important to point out as well, because you cannot, uh, you know, halakhically mandate something for non-Jewish women. That's why he says, well, if you disagree, okay, we don't have anything in the Kehilot or the Ecclesia of Thotheo, Theo meaning God, okay, whatsoever about this ruling, because this was not what was brought down by the, uh, the rabbinic ruling in Acts 15 between Yeshua's disciples and the Zikanim, the elders which referred to the Pharisees when they met about the subject matter. Now, another area we see about the concept of Mitzorah in Paul's writings is regarding the remembrance meal of Yeshua. And this refers to a minhag now that's passed down from Yeshua himself to his disciples. And there's a remembrance meal the night that Yeshua, before he died, he had a meal. And this is disputed about did he observe Pesach. Now the Gospel of John says no. The other Gospels, it's undecided, right? There's a conflict of interest regarding that situation there. But nonetheless, Paul mentions that regarding that remembrance meal, he says that I have received, he says over there, parlemevano kurios, or kibalti animehadon, I have received from the master. Kurios sometimes is translated as the UK Vavke in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Tanakh, but it does not always mean Hashem. It normally you can refer to the Hebrew equivalent adon, which means master. And here Paul says, ki kein kibalti animehadon, or as he says over, once again, in the Greek over here, parlemevano kyrios, that I received from our master. Obviously, he received this from the disciples of Yeshua. Luke also talks about this in his gospel, who got it from Paul. That which I transmitted to you, that our master Yeshua, on the night in which he was betrayed, and et halechim, he then took the bread. And he says to eat this and remember to me, drink the, the kiddush and remember to me, etc. Now, what's important about this over here is that the Greek word, parlemivano, which is in the first person singular, it's from the root verb, which is parado, uh, paradosis, okay, which I just mentioned before which, before, which refers to the transmission 
of Jewish law, which once again in Greek can refer to either the Raita de Rabbanan or a minhag that's brought down from one's rabbi. Now the last example of Paul employing, employing uh, or applying, I should say, the concept of mitzora in 1 Corinthians is relation to de Raita, which is a, a biblical ruling where Paul actually applies a style of midrash where he mentions nome gerapte or katu batorah that it is written in the Torah gerapte or grapho in Greek is where we get in English graffiti from, and there he says in First Corinthians fourteen twenty one quoting from Isaiah twenty eight eleven to twelve which deals with the passage of women remaining silent in the synagogue in relation to the conduct of worship, he says over there hein katu batorah or nome gerapte that it is written. And he quotes the prophet with a foreign speech, and in another language I would speak to this people, yet for all that they would not listen to me. Amar Hashem says Hashem. Now the context of Isaiah, why Paul is quoting it as a midrash, is this refers obviously to the people not being in a sense of yichud, of, of, of achdud, I should say, unity with Hashem, okay, in relation to the Torah. And so at this passage of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about a seder, an order, okay, of how you worship in the synagogue. Now, anyone who worships in the synagogue, you know the word seder is related to the word or siddur, right? There's an order of our prayers that we pray by. Is this a coincidence? No, it's a context. This is why it's very important. Christians tend to misunderstand this. Context is normally their greatest enemy. Now, the other thing I want to point out here, I'll pull this back up on the screen. The first word highlighted in Greek here, it says nome, okay? However, the, the, the actual, the, the noun here, nomos, okay? Uh, nomos just straight means law in Greek. That's all it means. Now the problem with understanding Paul half the time is that when he speaks about nomos in Greek, which law is he speaking about? And this is a problem when you translate from Hebrew to Greek and then you translate to other languages, English, Spanish, Italian, etc. In Hebrew, law can have many variables to it. There's Torah, which means destruction from Yara, which means to instruct. We have a Chok, or the plural form Chukim, which are a decree or decrees. We have a Mishpat, we have a Dat, right? And these all have a context to each other, right? Like a Chok and a Mishpat. What's the separation between the two? Chok or Chukim refer to commandments of the Torah that don't make logical sense. Paraduma, Shatnis, things of that nature. Mishpatim refers to mitzvot that do make logical sense. Right then you have dot, and then you have the situation where it's not just what's in the the, the Torah Shabbat Tab, the written Torah, but what's also mentioned in the Baalpei, the oral Torah, right, which ultimately goes down to the root of dealing with halacha. Halacha is another thing we normally translate as law, you know, as a, as a colloquial term, which is cholek, which means how one walks, how one conducts himself. Right? There's no equivalency to that inside of the Greek language. And same thing when we translate into English. So this is a problem why Paul is completely misunderstood and misinterpreted and misrepresented it by the Christians. Now, the liturgical section of 1 Corinthians contain two instructions regarding women during worship. One is the head covering issue, which is in 1 Corinthians 11, 13, or 3 through 16. And also the second is their silence inside the synagogue. And that's 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 36. And between that, Paul talks about working a Seder, having an order inside of the congregation. When Paul speaks about the reason why a woman must cover her head, it is in relation to being married. Paul mentions how according to Scripture that the woman comes from the man. We see here in 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 10, he says over here, Ki ein ha'ish min ha'isha, for the man does not come for the woman. But the woman comes from the man. And that is, right, the actual order of the creation between male and female physically in the Torah. And therefore he says, Likewise, neither was the man created uh, for the woman. However, But the woman was created for the sake of the man, to be an uh, ezer konegdo, to be uh, an assistant, right? And therefore, he goes on to say, for this reason, the woman needs to be modest and she needs to el rosha, she needs to cover her head. Now, Paul's obviously employing a, a concept that sits well inside a Jewish uh, context, but he's applying this to the non-Jews, right? 
which once again, they don't have a legal obligation, but if they're going to conduct themselves in a manner with the Jews inside the synagogue, then it would be relevant for them to learn to adopt and assimilate these concepts. Now what's fascinating about this passage that we just read here, over in Josephus' writings, the Jewish historian, we actually find an identical statement where Josephus mentions the reason why a man is superior to a woman is that God gave authority to the man. And this is brought down in Josephus. And I happen to actually have a Hebrew copy of Josephus, which normally is in Greek. Okay, so he goes on to say over here, that a, the woman says that the law is in all things inferior to the man. Okay, that she is inferior to the man is what he's saying here. Let her therefore be submissive, not for her humiliation, but that she may be directed for the authority, uh, be directed, excuse me, for the authority has been given by God to man. And the concept of authority here, hamem meshala, reshut, or in the Greek, uh, um, kratos, or yeah, kratos is how it is in the Greek. This is basically referring to that God has given authority to man. Now, what's interesting about this passage here is that when Josephus first says, what's highlighted in yellow, V'ha Torah, Omeret ki ha'isha, min ha'ish, that the, the law says, or the Torah says, that the woman is inferior, l'kol devar in all things, to man. Well, there's no actual direct pasuk or verse in the Torah that says this verbatim, right? So normally an individual who has no contextual understanding of Judaism, Torah, Halakha, they will come along in a woke generation that we live in today and say, see, the Bible is patriotic, the Bible is male chauvinist, and da-da-da-da-da, right, with all their stupid shtuyot that they actually peddle out there. The Torah mentions that a woman is subordinate to her husband in relation to the order of creation because she was designed to be an assistant to him. And that's exactly the main purpose. If we go back to the creation story in Bereshi 2.18, we read over there, Vayomer Adonai Elohim loto yot ha'adam. Hashem Elohim said it's not good for man to be alone. Levado, and therefore, he says, e lo ezer kenegdo. And therefore, I will make a helper corresponding to him. So when Paul and Josephus speaks about a woman being, uh, uh, pachut, being inferior, to a man. It's, it's referring to the actual subordination or inferiority of seniority, if I can use that term, right? That she is to assist him, that she is under his mimashala or, or, or kratos, his authority, okay, his the reshut. Therefore, both Paul and Josephus is speaking from the aspect of Jewish culture that understands the role of a woman, in this case a wife, is to assist her husband. She's not uh, more authoritative to him. According to Halakha, a woman is not, was not and is not, contrary to many modern Jewish movements, is not permitted okay, to be seen in the public space with her hair uncovered. The Mishnah tells us that if a married woman goes out in public with her hair uncovered, it puts her at risk of actually getting a get, of receiving a divorce. We find this in the Mishnah, Masechet Ketubot, uh, okay, 7 6. It says over there the following women can be divorced without receiving a ketubah. One who violates, it says over here, al dat Moshe vichudit, the law of Moses, or the law, I hear the law of halakha. Normally, some translations of the Mishnah might say are the laws of Jewish ways or Jewish customs. Uh, you know, very strange, big, you know, say ambiguous, but translations that don't really reflect it. I just put law of halakha. Because here the word Yehudit, it refers to the standards of modesty that are not actually found explicitly in Torah Shebektav, the written Torah, but are traditionally observed by Jewish women. According to the Mishnah, a wife loses her right to her ketubah only on the grounds if two witnesses, you know, uh, credible witnesses, testify that she sinned and therefore she was warned beforehand that a wife who commits such a sin regarding what she's doing, she is going to receive a divorce without her ketubah. A lot of this falls back on the issues of dealing with the sota that we find in Parsha Naso. Um, if a woman is found flirting with a man, she's behind a closed door, even with her clothes on. Judaism does not measure adultery uh, in the actual physical act. 
but in the attention of the act in some cases. And so we see here that she could be warned, and if she's found violating that warning by credible witnesses for the Beit Din, then she's at risk of losing her ketubah. So we continue on with the Mishnah, and it goes on and asks, Ve'ezuchidat Yehudit, what is the violation of Yehudit, this halakha? Well, these are the breaches of modesty that harm the marriage. As the following example, she goes outside with what? With Ve'rosha parua, with her head parua uncovered or she spins wool in the marketplace with wide sleeves, that when she raises her hands, she exposes her arms. Now, the arms here is a colloquial expression, which means that you can actually see down the actual arm sleeve, possibly towards the chest area, exposing other things, or giving the, uh, the, uh, the um, attention of creating a desire, okay? Or that she in kodam, you know, or she speaks, with every man, right? She has the attention, she's being flirtatious. These are grounds of a woman, you know, losing her ketubah. But we see here a woman who does not have her head uh, covered. The Midrash actually comes along and explains that the origins of why a woman is required to wear a head covering is because of the transgression of Chava when she calls Adam to sin back in Gad Eden. We read this in Bereshit Rabbah. It mentions over there, and this is a very interesting question we're going to mention here. It says, Why does a man go out with his head uncovered? Whereas a woman has her head covered. And so Rav Yehoshua, he answers, Amar Lehain, he says to them, to one who violated the transgression and is embarrassed from people about it. Now this alludes to Chava, the sin of Gad Eden. And this is, this is why a woman goes out with her head covered. Now this is very interesting, very, very interesting, because if you take a look at the beginning part of this Midrash, it raises a question where it says, Why does a man go out with his head uncovered? And so what this indicates is that, whoa, were Jewish men going out back in the day without a kippah, a yarmulke on their head? Yes. This is very important, okay? This Midrash also validates, okay, that there was no halakha, nothing legally binding for men to have a head covering. No kippah, no yarmulke, no nothing. And so this will actually appear to reflect the state of Jewish observance in the times of Paul when he said that a man does not need to have his head covered. Going back here to 1 Corinthians 11, 7, he says over here, um, that a man does not need to cover his head. Why is that? For he is the image and glory of God. However, but the woman, he is the glory of man. And so obviously we're talking about the concept of authority or the order of creation and, and the concept of reflecting that authority. Now, while we're on the subject matter, for those out there who may be ranting and raving and kvetching, oh, we're supposed to wear a kippah, and yada, da, 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 just stop one second. The custom to wear a kippah, to wear a yarmulke, okay? And by the way, yarmulke, in my opinion, uh, the name reflects uh, the idea of a head covering more than kippah, because yarmulke is a contraction of the Aramaic word yara, from Hebrew yara, which means reverence of, fear of, malka, the king, okay? And therefore, it's a reference of kingship and it refers to one wearing it out of respect for God. However, the custom to wear a kippah is considered midot chasidut. It's a pious act. And if you want, you can take a look in Biur Hagra to Orachaim, uh, specifically 8.1. The Vilna Geyon, he actually teaches over there that there is no halakhic obligation to wear a kippah, and this includes when one davins when one prays, okay, when one says a blessing, or even when one studies the Torah. While the Gemara Masechi Kiddushin, over in 31a, mentions that Rav Huna would not walk more than four cubits or six feet with his head uncovered out of respect for the Shekhinah, there is no halakhic proof in the Mishnah that required a man to cover his head. Zero. Okay, so if one tries to justify wearing a kippah vase upon the Gemara when the Mishnah doesn't say that, you're trying to put the cart before the horse. It doesn't work that way, okay? If you want to wear it, you can wear it, which is why the custom to wear a kippah is purely midot chasidut, okay? Now, obviously, when you're inside the, the sanctuary of the synagogue, out of respect, since it's a microcosm of the Beit HaMikdash, we cover our heads. 
Now, while we're on the subject matter, one of the things I want to point out that's important is that you got to realize that when Paul is dealing with this audience in Corinth, he's dealing with individuals who are from non-Jewish backgrounds who also were a part of other religious beliefs, pagan beliefs, okay? And what we need to understand about that in this Roman Hellenistic Greco society that he was in, you have to understand the context that in his epistle, 1 Corinthians chapters 11 to 14, are dealing with the topic of women in relation to head coverings and liturgy. In those days, the Greeks and the Romans had different religious customs to head coverings. In fact, it's recorded by Roman historians that Roman men, they would wear the special veils over their face during their religious ceremonies. Women were not allowed to participate in those ceremonies. While it's reported that Greek women, they would participate with their men in, religious, in their religious ceremonies while letting their head be uncovered, let their natural hair show. Now, contrary to popular opinion, okay, Paul never wrote to a church, right? Paul is not the poster child of Christianity as is taught in Jewish circles, and he did not do away with the Torah as it's taught in Christianity. So when Paul addresses these issues, these are halakhic issues. That's important. Okay, Paul was writing to synagogues. Now in Greek, the term ekklesia, which translates into English as church, is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew kahal, kehilot, kehila. And the word synagogue, anyway, is the Greek term synagogia. That's all that means. It's the equivalent of the Hebrew Beit Knesset. And so Paul was dealing with these synagogues in the diaspora that had many non-Jews attending their services. Why were these non-Jews attending? It's very possible they were the product of assimilation or mixed marriages. In fact, we know that Paul had a Talmud, a disciple whose name was uh, Timo, uh, Timothy. Now, Timothy, which is not a Jewish name, obviously, Timotheos from Greek, his father was Greek, his mother was Jewish. Now, his father was obviously a pagan Greek, something of a Hellenist per se. His mother was Jewish. The New Testament mentions the moment Paul found out that Timothy did not have a bris, was not circumcised according to halakha. New Testament mentions that Paul immediately took this kid's tuchus to get circumcised. No questions asked. And that should also raise a lot of red flags for Christians who teach that Paul was against the law. He taught against it. You know, we're under the grace of Jesus. Paul was very adamant and zealous when it came to fulfilling the mitzvot. The fact that he took Timothy and immediately got him circumcised because he found it repugnant that this kid was a Jew born from a Jewish mother. Now, there's other situations where maybe people were the product that their father was Jewish, but their mother was a Hellenistic Greek or a Roman. Obviously, the words are not Jewish, which means according to halakha, they're not Jewish. And here they are identifying with Judaism in the diaspora. Or maybe they actually found the Jewish faith more appealing compared to their paganism. Nonetheless, Paul's job was to design a system of halakha based off the halakhic ruling that's brought down in Acts 15 for non-Jews to abide by. And the four halakhic rulings in Acts 15 are identical to the four prohibitions in the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach. In fact, before the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach are mentioned in the Gemara Masech Sanhedrin, okay, they're mentioned in the Book of Acts, hundreds of years beforehand, okay, which is also very interesting and eye-opening when dealing with the subject of Noahide laws. And so when Acts mentions this ruling, it mentions Yeshua's disciples, the Not Srim, okay, which does not mean Christians in Hebrew, but that's another topic. They sat and they met with the Zikanim. Now, who are the Zikanim? Zikanim is another title for the Sanhedrin, but not the corrupt Sadducean Sanhedrin, but they sat with the actual Sanhedrin, okay, of the Pharisees, whether that was devised of uh, those reflecting the, the view of Hallel or Shammai. And there's discrepancies as well in the sense that you had certain Pharisees from Shammai who felt, felt that in order for non Jews to be, quote unquote, saved or have salvation, they need to be Jewish. We know that this view was not reflective in the writings of uh, the teachings of Hallel. Uh, Yeshua's disciples didn't feel that was necessary, so the ruling that was brought down is that they would abide by these four prohibitions. Once again, these four reflect the seven laws of Noah. Okay, so Paul's job was to create a system for them. And obviously the system that he went to create is something compatible within the system of Judaism. Okay, halakha. However, he could not mandate non-Jews to observe halakha. So he instead would extract areas based upon halakha but are applicable for Jews and make something uh, compatible for the non-Jews. Like when he talks about the issue of marriage, right? For an example, before we go back on here, 
He never tells a non-Jewish believer to marry a Jew. Why? Because unless they're Jewish, they can't marry a non-Jew, okay, etc. So he tells another a non-Jewish believer to find another believer who's a non-Jew, right? If, you're, if they're non-believing spouse, their pagan spouse leaves them, he says leave them. Don't pursue them, just let it be. If you're going to be married or find someone, find another non-Jewish believer, okay? He never told the non-Jews to marry Jews, okay? Paul was not like the modern messianic movement of Christianity. He was very committed to the Torah, and I would challenge that even against some of the quote-unquote anti-missionaries that attack the New Testament based upon the, super, the glorious translations of the English language, which are complete garbage in my opinion. No offense to anyone out there. Read the actual original manuscripts. Now, when addressing the issue with women and their role in the synagogue, Paul ruled that women need to check it. Check it, Bavakasha. Keep silent in the synagogue. And they need to learn Torah from their husbands. Now, this is Paul, Paul the Apostle, the poster child for Christianity, is telling women to shek it in the synagogues. Okay? Was he a male chauvinist? What's going on over here? So we're going to pull up the passage over here, and this is going to be found in, let's see here. This is going to be brought up over here in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. And he says over here, Nishachim bekinisiot, and let your women be silent, okay, in the synagogue. For they have no authority, lachen rishot ledaber, to speak, no authority to speak. However, they are what under obedience, as it says, kasher aramara haTorah in the Torah, okay? Now, he doesn't quote a pasuk in the Torah, but obviously he's alluding to the concept that he's been consistent with going back to chapter 11. They're underneath the authority of their husband, okay? And he says, if they wish to learn anything, let them ask their husbands bevetan at home. Why is that? For it is a shame for women to speak where bekahal in the congregation in the synagogue. Now, what's interesting about this is that juxtaposed to Paul saying that women need to be silent in the synagogue, he spoke about the order of worship in the synagogue. Seeing that the call for women to be silent in the synagogue is juxtaposed to the order of worship in the synagogue, it would clearly appear that Paul is defining the halachic ruling of how people need to conduct themselves in the synagogue. And you know, it's very interesting for anyone who's a student of the Shulchan Aruch, what is the actual laws that actually come right before Hilchot Beit Knesset, learning the laws in the synagogue, is the laws of doing business. Why do we learn about the laws of doing business, okay, you know, before Beit Knesset? Because Shulchan Aruch is trying to remind us First, how we conduct business that we don't do it inside the synagogue, right? The way we approach Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the synagogue, gives us the understanding, the inspiration of how we conduct ourselves morally in the business world. It also teaches us to keep our mouth shut and not talk about business when other people are trying to dive in. For those out there, they know what I mean, right? Now, according to the sages, women are prohibited from leading the synagogue in prayers and reading the Torah. We find this brought down in the Megillah, uh, the Bavli 23a, which is also found in detail to Tosefta, the Megillah, as I left there in the quote. And it says over there, Tanu Rabbanan, the sages taught over there, a kol olin le minyan, all people are counted towards a minyan, which is a quorum of ten people. And it says here, of the, uh, of the seven readers, now we're talking about the aliyot that the Torah is read on Shabbat, right? Even a minor, and it says, even a woman. However, a vault, but the sages, they said, Isha lo kevod sivu, sibu, excuse me. A woman should not read the Torah out of respect for the actual congregation. So what the sages are saying here is that a woman is not accepted as what we call a shalich sibor, the leader of the congregation. They are not permitted to pray, okay, or to lay, to read the Torah in the name of the community. According to Jewish law, a woman does not have the same biblical obligation as a man. A man is time-bound to the mitzvot in the Torah. That's why when the Torah mentions that when you retired and when you arise in the morning, there's a time-bound obligation of when we recite the Shema and also before we go to bed. 
they are time-bound mitzvot. Women are not time-bound by the mitzvot. So before I get emails for a bunch of woke liberal individuals out there who are Anglitarian in nature, please, save it. We, we, we paskin by what Chazal bring down, not by Haskalah movement out there. Okay? And so what we see here is that women are not equally bound by the same mitzvot as men. They have mitzvot, right? But they're not time-bound. So based upon this concept, the halakha rules that women do not have the authority to speak in the name of men. Okay? So when Paul ruled that women should learn from their husbands at home, we learn in various places in the Mishnah, such as Masech Sota, that a father is obligated to teach his daughters the Torah. Now, when a woman is not married, she's under the reshut, or the authority of her father's house. However, when she is married, she's then under the reshut, the authority of her husband. And so from this, we can deduce, okay, we learn, I should say, the obligation to teach a woman Torah is the responsibility of the husband once he is taking the responsibility of the father-in-law over in the life of his wife. And therefore, a woman has a question, this and that, she learns from her husband. So Paul is not sexist, he's not a male chauvinist in any sense. Paul was very punctual in the halakha. And by the way, earlier when we quoted the whole thing with Corinthians, Paul mentioned that, you know, he, he found it that if a woman doesn't pray with her head covered, it's might as well to keep her head shaven, right? because she's no more different than a woman with a shaved head. In other words, Paul appeared to uh, find it repugnant that a woman doesn't daven, okay, or doesn't keep her head covered, especially when it's in matters of holiness and other things, especially when she's married. Now, it's interesting. I don't have it on the screen, but it just came off the cuff of my mind. I'm reminded of the Mishnah Masachet Nazir, and this is brought down in Perak Dalek Simenhe, chapter 4-5. Over there, the sages mention that in the situation, if a husband... This is based off the Nedarim vows in Masechet uh, Parsha Matot, where the Torah mentions that if a father hears his daughter making a vow, he disagrees, he can nullify the vow. If a husband hears her, his wife making a vow, a neder, it's a personal vow, he can nullify it. Over there, the Mishnah mentions that if a woman attempts to take on a neder nazir, a Nazareth vow, which a woman is obligated to do so, and the husband is does not want him or does not want her his wife to do so he can negate the vow and the reason why the mission says is because the man does not want his wife looking like Sinead O'Connor all right doesn't want her with a bald head he doesn't find it uh, appealing whatsoever that his wife's head looks like a cue ball on the game of pool okay if I could throw some comedy in there so right there we see is that yes in parts of Jewish culture and society Men found it repulsive that women would shave their hair because normally that would be a look that a man would have. Okay, normally women don't thin out and bald like men do. Okay, they have the better advantage. Even though we say shaloi isha, thank you, Lord, that you have not made me a woman. Right? They have that advantage. So we see the Mishnah Masachet Nazir mentions that some men had a problem, married men, that they would not want their wife to take a neder nazir because they don't want to look at their wife with a shaved head. Paul, we see in 1 Corinthians, he mentions that, that, hey, listen, you know, you might as well have a shaved head then. So obviously, where did Paul get this from? He gets it from the halakha, okay? Contrary to what people were taught about him, he was very well learned in these things, way before the Mishnah was actually written down. These were things that were obviously floating around in Jewish law that was actually observed, okay? Whether or not they were ruled upon or not, there was no halakhic mandates for some of these subject matters. But nonetheless, what we see is that Paul ultimately... He mentioned that, once again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, that if someone was in disagreement with him on these issues, there's no mandatory halakhic ruling about a non-Jewish woman having to wear a head covering and that concept, okay, because non-Jews are not obligated to observe the Torah unless they become Jews. And so, in conclusion, what we learn from this is that when it comes to coverings, head coverings, when it comes to the liturgy, Paul instructed the women in Cornet who are new Gentile converts to the God of Israel, that they need to adopt Jewish customs. Because who else are they going to learn? Islam wasn't in existence at that time. Uh, Joseph Smith and his golden tablets with the angel Mormi, or whatever the heck the guy's name is, they weren't around at the time. Okay, and the Gospel of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, or whatever the heck's floating around Christianity, that didn't exist at the time. Okay, rather what was in existence was the Torah and Jewish law. And so the only system that Paul can teach these people was obviously what was passed down for him based upon the halakhic ruling in Acts 15. 
And therefore, this is what he taught. However, he cannot force it upon anyone. But if these people were going to continue to show up at a synagogue and worship with the rest of the Jewish community, they needed to consider abiding by these customs and these traditions, these minhag and nusak, as we call it. And so, in conclusion of this, this is my uh, little spiel, and, and, and once again, in light of the recent topic that was on Rabbi Asher Mays' podcast, discussing head coverings, which was in relation to the question of head coverings being mentioned in the New Testament. Now, for some of you guys who never heard this type of explanation before, and it's quite eye-opening, if you ever have a question you want to email me, feel free. You can reach out to me at rabbi at 70 faces of Torah. Dot com and I will get back to you. And if you're interested in learning with me, you can also find us over at 70 faces of Torah.com, sulamyahoo.com, where I have special classes and teachings on the subject matter. And uh, Bazar Hashem, I also plan on coming out with the end of the year with a special commentary on the Basura Matthai, the Gospel of Matthew, which is completely from within the framework of Judaism. Okay, and this is very important, the historical. A background that deals specifically from the organic system of the Jewish perspective, not theologically motivated from anything within Christianity. Uh, so other for that, hopefully you guys were blessed by this information. And so I'm going to sign off. Thank you for taking the time out to study with me on this subject matter. May the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov bless you and your families. Shalom and go to you.